Welcome to this video. It is the 11th of May 2013 today and we are here in Pretoria, South Africa. We are in fact in the offices of the Sarchi Chair at the University of South Africa, UNISA. And I'm sitting here with one member of the Sarchi family. And it would be lovely if you could say your name and who you are. My name is Kikan Semang <coughs> Zipora Muichela. I come from the semi-rural uh, part of South Africa, known as Northwest Province, in the small agrarian town of Swaizarenike, where I received my basic schooling. And from there, I moved on to high school at a boarding school in Muruleng in Rustenburg. And then it was during the turmoil years of the problems of education in South Africa in 1976. So I've really lived during that period firsthand. And from there, I studied um, uh, privately um, through uh, what we call correspondence okay. or on my own, let me say, um, just to try and upgrade my metric because I didn't pass my metric as a result of the 1976 riots. And uh, I was failing metric in class while I was still a student yes. in class, my e grade 12. Yes. Yes. As a result of those riots of 1976. Okay. So I was paid for by a bursary. So now that because we had failed, we, some of us who, whose our parents could not afford, we lost all the opportunity of feathering our education. Oh. So I had to go back, um, look for a job. Fortunately, most of my family members were teachers who taught us. So I got a job as a private teacher because I didn't have a formal qualification of teaching. So I started teaching at a very, you know, early years, in my early 20s. So I started teaching, teaching small ones. And uh, the following year, I raised money to go back to school. Wow. So I wasn't sure of what I want to do because all my hopes were dashed up. Wow. And uh, I had to go to a school where I was doing accounting, typing the old typing and uh, economics and also doing um it was three of those and also doing something on you know needlework or mm. something yes i mean clothing mm -hmm. yes and then after that i felt this is not what i wanted to do then the following year i came back home then i came back to johannesburg where everybody comes for gold in coats and uh, looked for some school and I learned all these other small courses because there was promise of a job when you complete, but that was not the case. And in the meantime, I realized that without my grade 12, you know, like we were told that without education, you'll never be su successful. You will never climb the social ladder. So I had to do something and improve my metric qualification. So I enrolled with the Department of Education and Training then, and uh, I wrote my metric privately, and I got a senior certificate um, without an exemption. By without an exemption, it meant that I could not go, you know, I did not qualify to go to a university as one of, the, according to the scores there. But uh, I was over 23, so if you were over 23 years of age, and then you had passed with the, those low quality scores, but you were over 23. On the basis of age, you could go to the Department of Joint Matriculation Board, coincidentally, which was housed in UNISA, University of South Africa. You would come and apply for an exemption, meaning that the exemption was giving you three years to enroll for a degree. So you had to qualify within the three years. If the three years can pass, um, and then you had not yet what whatever you would forfeit that you status would lose, this lose years. So you had to work very hard that um, you finish within that record time. So I was under that pressure and I had to struggle again. I had to work as a domestic worker, you know, to try and raise money because right. my parents could not afford. And uh, in 1982, there was a rumor that there's going to be a university that is opening in Soweto. It was called Vista, University of Vista then, um, which is no more, you know, after the, the uh, democracy, 
there was this that phase of the measure of universities where formerly marginalized universities were now brought into the mainstream universities yeah so that's where i got my junior degree in 1989 um and then after that i got my ba at bachelor of arts in education which was a four-year degree and then i went to vets university uh, part-time while I was struggling to get a teaching post to do my B.Ed. Th that is an honors in teaching. I got that in two years and then I enrolled for my master's at the same university, University of Wiesvatersrand. And uh, during that year there was a program that was introduced so we were the uh, the guinea pigs of that program of uh, postgraduate diploma in education. So what actually happened is that our master's were based on our proposals having been passed we were awarded a qualification called postgraduate postgraduate diploma in education so i got a postgraduate diploma based on my my proposal having passed and my proposal was i always like relating to it uh, it was based on the relevance of oral sources in education mm -hmm. And that was my starting point of starting to question the dimensions and the history of knowledge production. Mm. Because, I mean, we were, it was like a project actually started at honors level. Then the question was, in our case as Africans, what is going to be our oral sources? Because we thought that when we talk of refer sources of references, we're only thinking of bibliographies. Mm -hmm in the library, mm -hmm. the books and all that. Now what are all these right. oral sources? Where are the libraries for that? Yes, for that. And then it was a real, real issue. And then from my history background, I'm a history major and I specialized in history and also in one of the indigenous languages called Setswana. Mm -hmm. So I went back. For me, it was easier to identify immediately that what are the kind of original sources that I, f primary sources, I'm sorry, that I can use for my project. And I went back, I remember when I was growing up in my location where I come from, there was a very secluded place whereby not everybody could go there. It's in a very mountainous area. It's a semi-rural area. And we heard stories from our brothers that you can't just go there and then there will be miracles. There were what? Because there were people called the Quranas. The Quranas are the, I don't know, the third generation of the the Bushmen, mm -hmm. the great grandchildren of mm -hmm. the Bushmen who were in that area. And because there was uh, the way, the ecology of the place, the geographical setting of the place could actually tell if you read from geography that how do nomads live and the like. Because there was a stream, there was a river there, and you could see a lot of um, this cow drunk. Just one moment. Uh, could you close the door, please? Yes. They are speaking very loudly outside. Mm. Where you could mm -hmm. realize that there were a lot of cows, you know, this dry that we make uh, a fire with right now. And uh, all those things were going on in my mind. So as our brothers were relating the stories that they heard from our brothers, uncles and the like, I would just listen without not understanding. So when that time came for primary resources, it just occurred to me that I think this is where I am going to start. To me, that was history. And that was the type of history which the history books were silent exactly. about. And I started right there. And mm -hmm. I went there with no funding or whatever. During the holidays, I was a teacher. They would take my teacher's salary, go there, interview my uncles. And they would say, no, you need to go and ask permission. And I asked them, why should I ask permission to go there? They said, no, because that place is sacred. Mm. Oh, it's sacred. As a result of what? Then they mm. gave me the story. So based on what I've heard from my family history, I went there knowing that I'm going to get something that is not in the history books. So I became being very much radical about what education is all about, that what I'm taught, you know, what does it contain? Why? this and not that yeah. so i really become very much radical in my approach to anything that have had to do with education yeah. in all my studies so indeed i went there asked for permission and i remember one of the municipality workers he was african speaking you know like dutch yeah. whatever 
he volunteered to come with me. Everybody was scared. And and they were saying, no, 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 no. We're not going there because there are stories. When you go there, we heard that there'll be a snake chasing you or whatever. But for one reason or the other, I really don't know. I was so brave and determined that I am going to go there. And uh, as a result of that project, I um, there was a book which was part of my master's that was published in 1997. Um, I'm sure it is in the libraries of wherever. The title of the book is Teachers Transform History. Mm. Like I indicated, the transformation is an old age word. Okay. It has been developing. Some of us, we didn't know what it means. You know, it's only now that is so much being, you know, alluded as being the buzzword or whatever, but it, it has always been the things have been, education has been reforming, but in not in the way in which it brought about change and quality Absolutely. into our lives. It will, like our parents were making us to believe that if you don't go to school, you're going to struggle in life. You'll never live a successful life. You know, you'll never get married. You'll never, because men are looking for women that are educated, even if in some cases, parents could not even afford to take you to school. So education was a means of survival. If you were educated, you would see yourself that that, that was an elevation of a social status. You're going to be rich. You're going to live a better life or whatever. But as years went by, things were not like this. So that is why I'm saying that that project really, to me, it was an opportunity of 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 unbuckling this anger mm. that was in me, yeah. of asking the whys, why this and not that, yeah. why like this and not like that. Yeah. So I, I I embarked on it not knowing what I'm doing as part of my masters, and um, that is why in the book Teachers Transform History, the author is uh, is my master supervisor Sukrich et al. Et al. It's all she picked up all her master's students topics, and um, they are. All our work, our proposals were put in that book and they were published by Heinemann Publishers in 1997. So I'm sure if you can Google it mm. or there by Sue Kricher, mm -hmm. it's there. The first chapter was mine and I didn't know why they picked that. And when I read that chapter and I look at my manuscript, nothing has been cha changed. Mm. It's exactly as it was. Mm. I was as passionate, you know, when, when I was talking about these things and um, the the... The publishers said when they read that, they felt that they are not going to change anything because the melody and, and, and the message that it was contributing was so clear mm. and loud. And uh, yeah, that, that came so out of this, that. So this chapter, yes. do you think we have the right to put that on the website? Yes, you can. If, if yes, you, you send can it, it to me? Yes, you can. If mm -hmm. I'll check if we can Google it and we can mm -hmm. get it. And that then maybe you can because contact the publisher. Because I think people will be very interested yes. to know and yes. to read that chapter. You can, you know, contact mm -hmm. the publishers mm -hmm. and find out that uh, what it is. But I think it was, uh, it was not the right time okay. for that chapter. Because it didn't sell that well, no, you know. No, so even the message even was yes, even the royalties. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. It was they were just saying no, it's not selling, it's not selling. Mm -hmm. But I was amazed some years back when I, w I went to some conference after this merging, when the economical situation went down, even publishers were merging, you know, to try and strengthen themselves. So Heinemann merged with Parson or something. So they had this disc. And amongst these discs and the books on display, I saw that book there and I was saying, I can't believe this. So it seems like only then people were realizing that the message now is becoming relevant for the time mm. because it was after the 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 post um, independence mm. whatever. So at the moment I am after my troubles, you know, like uh, trying and going for greener pastures in life. I ended up at UNISA. Mm -hmm. I'm now um, a teacher in the department of language arts and culture mm -hmm. at the uh, University of South Africa, and I'm teaching languages modules and especially on uh, teaching poetry. Um, and it's uh, within the context of a society. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one, advanced for teachers who are improving their qualifications. Interesting enough that it seems like English is still taken as the English, you know, the language of learning and teaching mm. in South Africa. So to me, I'm in a situation, I'm in a position whereby it's an antithesis, I would say that, mm -hmm. because 
my study uh, which is i believe the last phase of my study you know at doctoral level that what i'm actually saying is that all these things that i've been carrying and trying to share with people to let these silent voices speak mm, mm. you know it's it's still staring in my face mm. that what is the problem yeah. why is it not coming up exactly. it's just on paper exactly. and then if you you talk to the teachers because we mostly train teachers it's like there's nothing like it's always said i remember one um professor safer day i'm sure maybe you know of him he's he was from the university of toronto i was one of the program coordinators for his program when he was here two years back or so he said um at one time the students history students somewhere and the professor was talking to them and one of the students asked that what is it that we can learn about africa why is it about europe all the time and that one that professor said to the students of course there's nothing that you can learn about africa it's only africa learning about europe mm. so to me all these things kept on coming back and when i eventually settled for the topic it was it has always been a burden that is why it became a problem of my study that there is something that is missing and it's not just coming out and most of the people did not have that edge and um, yes i would say the edge i don't know if it's the edge or the not being convinced enough mm. that it is real absolutely it will be accepted by the higher degrees yep. committees yep. you name them all all those conventional whatever structures that you had to go through but uh, having met uh, professor hoppers you know, I met her in 2002. She didn't know. I used to go to the University of Pretoria just to go and attend um, lectures for just keeping myself. I liked learning. Mm -hmm. It was after my back operation. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just sit at home mm -hmm. and whatever. So I used to go to the University of Pretoria and especially when the gender issues mm -hmm. were coming to say, let me learn about this gender issues yep. and the like. So that's where I met her. And um, um, one of her books had just been published the one f 2002 if i'm not mistaken and i bought the copy so i would read and read and read about this copy and then until in 2007 when she came back to south africa and my supervisor from unisa was going for an administrative position and she said i'm sorry i have to leave you but uh, you can choose for yourself that who do you think can um, supervise you and I looked, I looked, I couldn't until I saw, as I was just checking, I saw this name. I said, oh, this is the professor that was in um, uh, Pretoria some years back in 2002. Then I asked this professor if I can approach her. And she says, yes, she's not working for UNISA, but she's here for something. That was when she was coming to set up the Sachi chair. So that's how I made an appointment with her. And uh, we started. Actually, I was the first student. Yes, you must have been the first. Yes, <laughs> I was the first student. Wonderful. Oh yes, but I've been. I've had so many setbacks, mm. health setbacks. Mm. Yeah, like even now. But mm. uh, you know, things have happened. Oh, I admire you so much for your tenacity. <laughs> yes. You have you have a dedication, a lifelong dedication. Thank you very dedication. much. Thank you very much. Things and have happened. Uh, the world yeah. needs this. You know, yes. I think many many people who yes. uh, who watch this now they have very very similar thoughts. Yes. You know, this kind of anger yes. that you I have it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I have it and. Uh, you know, why that and why not mm -hmm. that? You know, mm -hmm. do we really learn mm -hmm. the right things? Mm -hmm. Perhaps not. Mm -hmm. I am I so mm. much admire mm -hmm. you and your voice is mm. so important mm. and the, the world needs mm. your voice. Thank you very so much. So I wish you all the strength Thank you very much. Uh, to go further. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a medical doctor uh, with mm. uh, health issues. So if you ever need advice on that, I'm there for you too. Yes. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Mm.